um, Andy Crouch made this comment that, that lament is the seed of creativity. And so we're gonna unpack that this evening um, and really explore what does uh, proximity, awareness with the brokenness of the world um, do and how does that help us actually unlock creative potential for what could be a reset, what could be possibility in the, the years ahead. Um, and as we thought about this forum, three people came immediately to our minds and we thought, you know, if we could get these three people in a webinar, in a Zoom platform and talk about this for an hour, an hour and a half, uh, it would be awesome. And uh, just so thrilled that all three of them could make this time and we're eager to jump in. And so let me just introduce our uh, panelists or our guests here at this time. Um, so first I'd like to welcome Mako Fujimura. Uh, Mako is a leading contemporary artist, author, speaker, uh, founder of the International Arts Mu Movement, uh, has written widely about a whole range of things, but certainly including confronting grief and trauma in art and, and how to kind of connect that to finding hope and mending. And so Mako, thank you for joining us. We're so excited. It's great to be here. Uh, second, I'd like to welcome, welcome Alyssa Wilkinson. Uh, Alyssa is an author and a film critic at Vox, also associate professor at King's College in New York, uh, and has thought also about a wide range of uh, you know, topics relative to our theme, uh, but interestingly also uh, has engaged with apocalyptic literature and themes, and, and I, think, I think that'll be uh, fun to dig into. So Alyssa, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, would love to welcome Lecrae. Uh, Lecrae is a Grammy Award winning uh, hip hop artist, recording artist, uh, founder of Reach Records. Uh, and Lecrae, whenever we do a, a Veritas event with you, it's always uh, such a privilege. So thanks for joining us this evening. Honored to be here, thank you. Uh, so let's dive in. Um, what I'd love to do just kind of as a way of icebreaker, kind of warming up to the conversation, is uh, we've done this the last two forms as well is uh, get a little glimpse of your lives and so all of our lives have been disrupted they've all been changed um in pretty big ways uh, at least most of us and so Alyssa, why don't we start with you you're a, a film critic uh there are no more movie theaters that are open i uh so anyway would just love to know how how has your life changed yeah it's been interesting i mean like you said there's no more movie theaters open right now um i think the biggest change from that has been that i've pivoted from covering blockbusters which i would normally be doing right now to covering almost entirely art house and independent cinema because they're the ones releasing to virtual platforms so that's been pretty exciting and then as my students can attest um i've been lecturing at a webcam um, for three hour stretches for the past few weeks while they chat at me, which has been um, not not too bad, I think. It's been pretty fun. Um, but because one of the subjects I teach is postmodern theory, it's sort of felt like we're doing like live immersive version of the class um, through our screens. It's been it's been weird. It's been weird. Well, glad we could provide you with another opportunity to jump on mm -hmm. Zoom. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Le Lecrae, let's uh, go to you. I mean, you're a recording artist. Uh, you do a lot of things that I've been following. You know, you're engaged with the homeless community. It just, there's a lot you're doing. How has your life changed? Oh my goodness. How hasn't it changed? Uh, you know, I think the biggest, most dramatic aspect of my life is um, running out of toilet paper. That's just that's, <laughs> that's horrific. Um, but no, um, you know what, I think, um, I, everything has changed. I mean, the patterns of life, the, the normalcy, I, I travel, I tour, I speak at colleges and places all over the, the, the world. And now, um, it's been, you know, regulated to home and just learning how to do it virtually. And so, uh, it is, as Alyssa was saying, it's, it's weird. Definitely the like online performances, that's weird. It's just weird, like performing, you know, to my computer screen, so yeah. <laughs> well, Mako, why don't we go to you? Uh, yeah, how's, how has your life changed? Well, um, I'm usually traveling in, in this period. I, I had several lectures that were canceled and um, I split my time between Princeton, my Princeton studio and Pasadena studio. So I, I end up going back and forth. Um, since I came back from California three weeks ago, I've been staying put. So that's definitely changed. On the other hand, for an artist, where I am always social distancing from the world, <laughs> kind of 
very high introvert. Um, I love to stay in my studio and work. So uh, I've been getting a lot of writing down and 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 uh, painting. Obviously, uh, behind me, they're all uh, I've been pretty productive. Uh, but at the same time, to my surprise, I've been as busy as ever doing these things. Uh, you know, tonight with you, but I. I I've been saying yes to almost every podcast because I, I think it's important. Um, I've also started a YouTube uh, session, um, sometimes live uh, sessions uh, at, right out of the studio. So people who subscribe to my YouTube recognize that this, this setup, I set up the studio inside the studio and I uh, have been talking about a generative way that we can use our time uh, even through our traumas. So, um, this has been uh, that's that's a new thing. I would never have done that apart from uh, this crisis uh, and this way of communicating through Zoom and other means is is, is fantastic and um, it, it has given us, I think, a new way to communicate. So I'm grateful for that. Well, one, I'd love to just kind of dive into our topic and Marco. That's actually a great kind of preamble uh, to what we're going to talk about. So why don't we actually start with you on this? Um, you know, a theme for us that we've been wrestling with over the series is this sort of connection between lament and creativity. And, you know, the Surgeon General started off our week by saying this could be one of the saddest weeks in uh, American history, right? C comparing um, to 9-11, comparing to Pearl Harbor. Um, Mako, I know that you were like three blocks away back in 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you've talked a lot about the impact that had on you and your mm -hmm. understanding of art and the connection between trauma and Mm -hmm. you know, beauty. Um, so I wonder if you could just maybe start us off here thinking about specifically lament and creativity. Um, how do you see these two things working together? Right. Uh, first of all, I, I lived three blocks away from towers with my small children and, and they grew up as ground, cho uh, ground zero children. Um, and I'm happy to say they're doing all well today. Uh, the eldest is married, has two children. So, um, and fortunately, none of us have been directly, directly impacted by uh, this uh, coronavirus. But um, I do, I have fallen in love with New York City and uh, it, it, it is uh, just a painful time to watch my beloved city go through uh, this time. Um, after 9-11, I would often meander to my studio only about 10 blocks north, and it was all a uh, sequestered area below Canal Street. Nobody could get in unless you can show proof that you live to work there. And I spent many uh, months um, just kind of trying to figure out what the future would hold uh, for an artist. And I, I really didn't know the answer. I, I still don't feel like I know the answer, but I, I knew I, I had to work through, through my own process of my own art, how uh, at least to ask the question well, and to enlarge the question in, in fact, uh, not, not try to find answers, but, but to probe into my, my own trauma, which um, I would say, honestly, I'm still dealing with. Um, it, it, it comes through in certain times and uh, certain moments. And so this is, I would also say, is far bigger than 9-11 in, in, in one sense that it is a global reality that everything is on pause. Um, you know, the entire world had to shut down because of this virus. And um, it has such huge impact, not just economically, but culturally and other, other means. And I, I think this is going to have um, ensuing, enduring uh, impact in, in the world. Um, I, I will say, though, we should remember <laughs> that the, the most uh, indelible marks made in cultural history has been done during trauma. Uh, Black Plague, uh, for Angelico, Shakespeare, um, people were making their work right as uh, one third of the population perished. Um, you know, all the writers uh, that, that we love, from J.R.R. Tolkien to C.S. Lewis to mm -hmm. Hemingway to J.G. Salinger, they all wrote out of 
traumas um, directly uh, out of traumas. So this is this is time for artists to um, harness their creative energies and and I mean we're doing it anyway, so we, we don't have to even try because that we intuit all of this. And um, but but I, I think it's a very important time for for us to focus on our inner voices and and let that speak uh, into the world and the my work for past uh, 20 30 years have been in response to what I call ground zero conditions of the world and uh, it has continued that journey um, ever since I'm trying I was trying to get out of it you know I was trying to get it, it, into uh, celebrating the feast, you know, at the end of new creation, <laughs> rather than trying to just, you know, respond to traumas. But um, I, again, I find myself um, uh, thinking about uh, lament, and uh, certainly Andy is right. I think I think that's that's the condition of our, our world, and uh, especially today. And it's important for artists to uh, uh, process that. Yeah, maybe just Lecrae, um, just to ask you to kind of reflect on that as well, and maybe add anything to kind of what Mako has sort of teed up there, uh, possibly just in your own experience, how you've experienced sort of this connection between the importance of grieving or beholding brokenness and lament and then creativity. Um, what might you add to that? Yeah, um, Mako said uh, some, some in incredible things there that, um, uh, trigger, you know, a, a lot of places and, and circumstances that I've experienced. One of the things that I, I, I believe is that, um, you know, writing out of trauma, um, uh, and writing out of, uh, these, these places of, of pain, um, you, what you do for others is that you show them that they're not alone. And so I think that, that art that's created uh, by wounded people uh, helps other wounded people understand that they're not experiencing this alone. Uh, the art in many ways becomes the uh, uh, expression of their reality. And, and so I think there, there's an element of that that I know I've written out of, of woundedness and it's connected with people in a very profound way. But, but then I also think that um, though wounds help other people know they're not alone, I think scars help people know that wounds can heal. And wow. so writing from a place of, of, yes, I've experienced trauma, but at the same time, I'm in a process or I've gone through the process of healing in the midst of it. I think that kind of art is, is uh, very special and effective as well. It helps people know that these scars um, that the, these wounds that we're going through that we're experiencing are healable and so um for me i think this has been a great time to revisit as as marco uh marco uh, said of uh, some of the artists that wrote um as they were navigating uh terrible things or from the other side of something horrific and, and painful um because it helps us get a perspective of how someone overcame uh something that we feel is just incredibly traumatic yeah, I, I mean, you know, Alyssa, you, you, you know, uh, engage with a lot of, <laughs> like a wide breadth of sort of artistic expression, certainly in film. Um, I mean, do you see this playing out as well, this sort of connection between, you know, lament and creativity and sort of where does your mind go on that? Yeah, uh, one thing I've been thinking a lot about, I think, is that art, um, so for artists, art making is like a language that they're speaking. It's how artists process and understand the world, and then they invite us into that experience. So I've been thinking about how art can help us translate um, our experience that we can't put words around. Um, like I can, I'm a writer, so I can write all day um, about the experiences that I'm having, but even then I can't always capture it. And so writers do this, painters do this, musicians do this, and all of these different ways of, um, I guess, apprehending the world or sort of an epistemological thing where we're trying to make sense of what it is that we're experiencing together. That's something that artists do for, um, 
for people who maybe aren't artists or who are creative in other ways or who are just trying to find language to figure out what it is that they're experiencing. And I mean, the Bible models that for us in the poetry of the Psalms and of other kinds of, um, you know, books of poetry, prophecy, things like that, but then, uh, you know, musicians, artists, you know, painters, filmmakers, people who make TV, all of these people have done this um, and given us, uh, even you can think about it as a metaphor, like it's something that we can wrap our heads around. So I've been writing about this a little bit recently because um, as soon as this happened, I found myself, like the night we quarantined, um, we sat down and wa started watching Chernobyl, the HBO show, which is just phenomenal art. It's some of the best TV I've ever seen. It's deeply sad. It's not about what's going on right now, but it also gave me something to work with, I think, inside of myself, like to start to process what I was experiencing and realizing that what I was experiencing was not just like being bummed out because I had some trips canceled and being kind of vaguely worried about getting sick, but actually grieving something mm -hmm. and feeling like this isn't how it should be. It's not even the way it had to be, but it is what it is. And so now we're going to have to go through it. Um, and I found that to be really uh, I can't say uplifting or inspiring at all because it left me sad, but it also helped me move through something um, that I wasn't expecting at all to have to move through even the week before. Um, I was at a film festival the weekend before this, so I had come home from a festival and basically just haven't gone out since. And it was a nonfiction film festival, so it's all documentaries. So it's people working with reality. And one thing that was significant to me even then, I was watching people take reality artists take reality and shape it into something that brought meaning into our reality. And I think that's what artists really are well equipped to do. Um, and it's pretty um, harsh, I think, to think about a crisis or, or um, you know, tragedy bringing forth good art because it sounds like we're trying to be opportunistic about it or something, but that's not really what's happening. It's just saying that um, artists give us language that, that politicians aren't going to give us and economists aren't going to give us and teachers aren't going to be able to give us and we're not going to be able to give ourselves. Um, so it's like a, it's a different language, like translation almost of what we're experiencing. Super helpful. And I think yeah. we'll dive even more into that in a little bit. I want to spend just a little more time on the kind of lament piece and then we'll move to sort of <laughs> more hope creativity. Um, I uh, got a question in from Katie Farrick, um, kind of popped up to the top here. And Lacred, I think I'd like to direct it to you. It's kind of, like, I think, in a way connected to the scars uh, idea. And she asked, how do you distinguish grief or lament in your work from despair? Mm. Um, mm. You know, could you maybe reflect on that for us? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think of um, grief as you know, acknowledging um, something grievous, acknowledging uh, loss or pain or um, something that uh, has, you know, deeply affected me um, in, a, in a sad way. And I think of despair as almost perplexed um, without hope, without solution, um, and, and at a place where, yeah, I'm, I'm ultimately hopelessness. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for me, um, I, I, I always want to challenge myself in my darkest moments, um, that I am not grieved to the point of despair, that I'm not grieved to the point of hopelessness, um, that I do have hope, um, you know, ultimately because I, I believe in the words of Jesus. I believe in uh, the eternal hope that he does offer. But um, even outside of that, I have hope that um, my life and, and, and every moment that I live, even going through trauma, it becomes the, 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 my ceiling becomes someone else's floor. And so I'm able to articulate and express the pain and the grief that I'm, I'm going through so that someone else can start there and have that as a foundation that they can walk upon and move forward. And I know that's greatly helped me 
um, historically, uh, I, I think of just being a, a, a child and not really understanding why I gravitated to the lyrics of Tupac. I didn't understand it, but there was so much pain and so much trauma that my own childhood was able to connect with. And, and what he did for me was he created a floor that I could begin to walk on. Um, and it was, he had hit his ceiling, of course, but he, he created a floor for me. And I think that's what, what grief, you, what it can allow is it can allow some pain. Another quick example I, I'll use, uh, it's kind of funny, but I, I remember being a teenager at working at a grocery store and I was riding a shopping cart and I shouldn't have been, but it flipped over. <laughs> it flipped over and it ripped my fingernail out of my finger. And I, I didn't know what happened. I just knew there was a lot of blood. So I covered it up. I went inside the store. I was kind of like screaming, wincing in pain. And I remember the butcher looking at me and he said, hey, calm down. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And I was like, how can this man assure me I'm going to be okay? And he held up his hand and he was missing some fingers. <laughs> and, and, and I can't explain to you, but it calmed me because it helped me understand someone had been through this or, or, or even worse. And, and that all hope was not lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Marco, I'd love to ask you to kind of continue with that thread. I mean, yeah. you, you've written a lot about, you know, how specifically even the suffering of Christ and sort of anchoring there mm -hmm. provides this kind of approach that you can take to embracing kind of the full range of grief to hope and mm -hmm. create out of that. Um, I wonder if you could just sort of you know, run with that. Yeah, first of all, that's a great question. What's the difference between lament and grief? Um, and I, I have to really just think about it while McCray was uh, uh, answering that eloquently. Um, I, I really, you know, when, when C.S. Lewis wrote Grief Observed, I, I think he had that approach right, because grief is something that you have to observe. Uh, from almost like you have to step out of yourself and look at yourself grieving. Um, I, uh, I lost both of my parents um, in in past uh, two years. And, and you know, the, the, that's an experience that as an artist, um, the, it, a personality that brings brings you to a certain point you know and and a new maybe a reality that you you haven't experienced before. And, and you almost have to step out of yourself and, and look at yourself differently that way and accept that, that things are different, you know. Um, and lament, it, it seems to me, is, is a disciplined practice mm -hmm. that we all have to learn to do. Um, you know, grief kind of comes to you uh, because of your loved one passing away or um, something that happens uh, to you. But lament is, is a universal condition. Uh, you know, one of, one of the um, possibilities, let's say, uh, that this crisis presents itself is the universality of the trauma. Um, there's no, no one on this earth who is not affected by this. And, and that seems to me is, is, is an amazing opportunity for a new opportunity that we never had before. Uh, everybody stopped right now and everybody knows somebody who's been affected. Um, and if they haven't yet, they will. Um, and and so, so this, this moment has a universal connect connective tissue, uh, as it were, um, because of the, uh, even though we may be separated by geography and cultures and language, um, this is universal. We, we can share, you know, after 9-11, what I, what I observed was that uh, downtown Manhattan became a true community that it never was really. Um, you know, Tribeca, um, if you're walking around in Tribeca, it was sequestered from the rest of New York. So you knew that total stranger walking her dog, you would stop and you could talk to her because you shared something uh, together, um, very similar thing. Things. And and this is going to be like that, uh, you, you know, across the world, 
and and so this is a, a, a you know in a, in a way amazing phenomenon but uh, so there'll be people grieving but what is the lament that we are called into you know university and how can artists help that um, uh, because whatever we do right now is going to be lament. So we, we can assume that what we do, what we paint, what we write, what we sing, uh, or even how we see a movie that was done before the crisis is going to be affected by how, how we respond. And so this, in a sense, that that's the seed of, I, I believe, uh, generating something new even though it may not be, again, it may not be solutions to the problem, but it opens up the question in a deeper way. Well, and, and I'd like to just actually ask you a follow-up. Um, you, you know, you, you've, you've commented in different uh, settings before about how art um, can be healing and art can mm -hmm. mend. Yeah. Uh, mend yeah. Words. Um, yeah, so I, I was I was thinking about when uh, Lecrae was speaking. Um, I, I just before the uh, this crisis happened, we we launched what's called the Kintsugi Academy, and um, here here's a sample of a Kintsugi. This this ball was fractured, and uh, in one of our academies, a designer um, mended it with Japan lacquer and filled it with gold. And this is a venerable tea tradition uh, harking back, back to 16th century Japan. But I befriended a Kintsugi master uh, who was willing to come to US. So we've been touring him uh, doing this art form, but he developed a technique where anybody can do this. Um, it, um, Japan lacquer is notoriously difficult. <laughs> And actually, uh, one third of the population is allergic to it. So he he discovered another form of Japan lacquer that that is easier to use. And so we have been doing these workshops where people bring in broken balls um, and or anything, toys or anything. And uh, in two and a half hours, you 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 get to go through the process. And we found it so effective uh, as a way of not, you know, people come in thinking, oh, we're gonna learn how to do fixing craft. But what this is, the first thing that Nakamura-san, the Kintsugi master says is, you came in to fix whatever you brought in, but we're not fixing anything. We're going to behold the brokenness. We're gonna look at the fissures and we're gonna hold the fragments for a while and look at it until it is beautiful. And then we can think about mending and to make new. And, and that, that says it all right there. And, and I, I think that's a proper way of uh, lament. Uh, it might even be a way to grieve. Uh, many participants uh, who participated in Kintsugi workshop told us that it was, it was absolutely healing for them because they began on the journey of healing, not trying to fix it, but trying to mend to make new. So that, that um, you know, is, is something that I, I've been thinking about a lot. Thanks. Um, I, I'm seeing another question here kind of pop up to the top. It's been up here for a little while. And Alyssa, I think this would be a great question for you. Um, the question is about, for those of us who are not artists, so not, you know, uh, how can lament, hope, and creativity be relevant to us? So I'm just thinking of, you know, those in our audience who, you know, appreciate art, looking for meaning and purpose like all of us are relative to this crisis, widespread crisis. Um, you know, for those of us who are not artists, how can lament, hope, and creativity be relevant to us? What, what would you say to that? I mean, I think one of the first steps is to remember that what artists create is meant to be shared, um, that artists do create as a way of working out the world. But I've always said, um, to my students anyhow that are I think of as a as a collaborative product between the artist and the audience and so what the audience is bringing to the thing that the artist has made is what creates art so like mm -hmm. Mako makes a painting and it's stunning um, but what really makes it a work of art is that I then come to it and I experience it with 
bringing my whole self to the experience. And we keep talking about C.S. Lewis, but his book, An Experiment in Criticism, has um, kind of a really great understanding of how this works. And so um, I think for a lot of us, what's important is that we don't go to our necessary looking for it to answer things or bring us a message, but more that we go to it looking for the hospitality that the artist has created um, and accepting it and bringing ourselves into it as well. And kind of both trying to get ourselves out of the way, but also being our full human selves. So that's really abstract, but I think of it in terms of like, it's actually natural, na uh, National Poetry Month, which seems to have landed at mm -hmm. the right time. Mm -hmm. um, and poetry is something that a lot of people feel like they don't understand or they don't, or it's like they're supposed to, um, Billy Collins has this poem about how his students always want to tie a poem to a, a chair and beat it with rubber hoses to get it to tell them what it means. But actually, <laughs> the way you're supposed to approach a poem is to sort of feel it and understand what it's what it is and not what it means, um, not the way we were taught to approach poetry in the third grade. And so I guess what I think of is like when artists are creating these works of laments or that are born out of crisis or all these different things, that we're coming to it with the openness to take whatever it is that they have put into it and also to put ourselves into it and to have that space. Mm -hmm. And then there's another step, and this has been an interesting one to see it develop um, over the past few weeks is um, being willing to share it with one another and um, use it as a grounds for us to access things that might be hard to talk about um, just with one another. So I've been watching people host like movie watch parties <laughs> or um, I was really enjoying um, this uh, piece from the New Yorker radio hour about um, I'm blanking on the DJ name, but he hosted like a nine hour dance party on Instagram live and people came and they loved it. And it was a way of them to like kind of escape their experience while also being very much grounded in their experience. Um, and it's giving us a place again, that we can do this. I mean, we are stuck behind these screens right now. Um, it's not easy. I don't like it at all, but it is important for us to remember that we're still humans. We're not just like hmm. beings without bodies. Um, or, you know, emotions or anything like that. We're not just productivity machines. And so for those of us who don't make art, and I don't really think of myself as an art maker, um, art is the place that has been created for us to come in and like join in the process together. So I, I, I'm looking at a, a few questions that are coming up that are fairly like practical. Um, and we'll get to it here in a minute. I would love to actually each of you to kind of give some advice to students um, as they're thinking about making, making culture in various ways. Um, but uh, first one is kind of more uh, personal, applicable, uh, maybe Mock or Lecrae, whichever one of you guys wants to take it. Um, I'd love to hear how each of you faithfully foster creativity in everyday life in moments that feel so discombobulating. Um, and I don't want to even assume that, like, maybe creativity is going on pause right now. I, I don't know what it actually looks like in your lives, but can you give us kind of a little bit of a sense of, like, day, daily, like, you know, what, what are you doing to foster a creative response? I'm, I'm going to say, maybe Marco's going to have an answer. I'm going to <laughs> relate uh, <laughs> very heavily. It's funny. I was just, I'm, um, I'm working on an album. Uh, called Restoration, and uh, there's a documentary that accompanies it. And it's funny because in the documentary, you're literally watching me go through um, this this period of time where I, I knew myself once as a, a creative trying to maintain the balance of family and life and work. And now I feel like a family man trying to maintain the balance of create, like, I, I cannot uh, escape the Nerf gun wars going on around me. Uh, I, I can't, I, I'm uh, the homeschooling and all the different, there's no escaping um, the four walls of my home to, to seek that out. And I'm very much, uh, I breathe in the energy of the city. I breathe in the energy of, of, of people and I love getting on a subway or getting on a train or um, and just being with uh, everyday people and, and seeing their experiences that brings me inspiration and so not being around that 
um, is, is makes it a lot harder for me to find the inspiration creatively. But I do realize creativity is also a discipline. So a lot of us are, are waiting for inspiration to just drop on our heads instead of working and creating and, um, and hopefully out of the quantity, we'll get some quality. Marco, how about you? Yeah, so uh, us introverts, um, um, I have <laughs> a good friend, uh, Amanda Lindsay Cook, who is a, you know, amazing worship leader, and she's now going independent, and she texted me and she said, I'm loving this time. I, I hate to say that, but um, it allows me to explore my uh, interior landscape, uh, which is a beautiful way of uh, saying what I have been feeling. And now that I slow down, I'm, I don't have to travel. Um, I'm, I'm stuck, um, you know, doing what I love doing. Um, I am most alive here in my studio. I feel God's presence um, and God's pleasure when, when I am painting. And to be able to have access to both the exterior reality happens to be beautiful spring in Princeton area. And um, because of everything slowing down, even when I was in California, the sky was just so stunning. Um, I'd never seen Los Angeles sky like that. And um, when the, you know artists observe those things and they are inspired by that and they are fueled by that and so every day i'm like a little child walking around my garden noticing little things and and uh, had i been kept my regular schedule i probably would have missed most of that um so i i think at such a time as this um when I remember, I do remember after 9-11, I couldn't paint. Um, that's, that was true. And, and I meandered into my studio just to, as a discipline. I, I would go just to go. And I would just sit there and read or basically not able to paint uh, for a while. But slowly, as I did that, um, I noticed that I had stretched this beautiful paper onto canvas um, I, I, before 9-11 happened. And so I just go, went through the motion of just showing up and then mixing materials and then doing what I do. And the resulting painting um, I have kept, I never uh, made it available uh, because it's a very special painting that I gave to my children. And um, it literally captures the intuitive reality of what I was sensing, the, both the darkness, lament, <laughs> grief, everything was in this painting and and I'm so grateful that I had that mo non utilitarian purposeless <laughs> art that doesn't really have any other purpose than than its own presence in in my life you know kind of kind of speaking back into my my heart uh, traumatized heart mm -hmm. and in this crisis, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate to say I don't have family members afflicted by this or um, friends, few, few of my friends seem to have had it, but they, they recovered good, uh, uh, well before the crisis hit. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I don't have that immediate trauma in yet. Um, so I, I'm trying to so God has given me an opportunity to reflect on this time um, almost as, as a sojourner to people who are suffering and, and being able to uh, capture some of their, carry on some of their trauma and some of their tears. And uh, mm -hmm. I speak a lot about John 1135, Jesus wept, two words that really don't make sense uh, because Jesus came into Bethany to raise Lazarus from the, from the grave. And he told his disciple that he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and life. And when he saw Mary angry, weeping, grief, in grieving, uh, grieving mode, uh, Jesus simply wept, um, and that made no rational sense. 
because all he had to do was bring Mary by the hand and bring her to the uh, grave, raise Lazarus from the dead and say to Mary, you have a little faith. You should have trusted me. <laughs> you know, I am here to show the power of God. No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus stood, um, you know, word of God stood silent with Mary and shared her suffering because it was important for him to do that. And Mary understood intuitively what that meant for her. So she goes, and her response was to get her wedding nard to anoint Jesus before he enters Jerusalem, uh, the most expensive, you know, uh, extravagant gift back to the creator. Uh, also, that doesn't make sense. These two uh, central pinholes for me to look at the entire Bible um, through. And, and, and because of the gratuity and extravagance of Christ's tears, we can today, we know that Christ's tears are with us um, today. And, and so that, that's the kind of the uh, base from which I, I even pretend, um, maybe, maybe by faith I can claim that I am painting with Christ's tears. And, and because that, that's you know, the profound reality of creation, gratuitous nature of creation that cannot be accounted for by the industrial pragmatism or Darwinian um, reality. And, and so to me, that, that's like the central part of the gospel and, and it's, it's where I draw my energies from. That was beautiful. I just, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> I want to thank you for Jesus' tears now. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, well, wow. Um, I'm just observing that as well. I, I, uh, I would love to take things in a little bit of a practical direction, um, if we can, if it's not too jarring. Um, and Alyssa, maybe kind of start off, you know, with you on this one. Um, you know, I'm aware that a lot of our students who are kind of you know, tuning in uh, and have over the last two forums have really been, I mean, in a season of upheaval. So there have been internships that have been canceled, jobs that have been canceled, uh, you know, question mark, a fairly legitimate question mark, I think, uh, about, you know, what school is going to look like in the fall. There's just a lot of uncertainty. And for a lot of the students we work with, um, whether or not these are students that aspire to be sort of artists in a traditional sense, um, so many want to be culture makers and want to be contributing and producing and making good of the world. Um, and now we're in this isolated, um, you know, disrupted moment and, you know, kind of looking for, you know, what to do with that energy that wants to make um, and contribute and, and meaningful contribution. So well, let's maybe start with you. What, what advice would you give to a student Let's say they, you know, let's say they're graduating, um, you know, job just mm -hmm. got canceled on them, like sitting at yep. home. What are you going to, what will you say to them? So I'm going to come at this from a weird direction, which is to say that um, while Mako was talking, I was thinking about the part of the Bible that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and this is because um, a weird effect of being in this lockdown has been that my husband and I were invited to a number of Zoom satyrs from our Jewish friends this week. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're going to attend two, which might mean we're doing more Jewish religious observance this Holy Week than Christian, but we'll see. Um, but in any case, um, I it struck me today how interesting that's going to be because satyrs are remembering a time of plague and crisis mm -hmm. and hardship, right, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. the Jewish people. And um, they're apocalyptic. I have to bring it around to this because I did write a book about this, but apocalypse and apocalyptic moments aren't about the end of the world. They're just kind of about the end of a world and the purpose um, historically of apocalypse, what that it means is it's actually a time of revealing. So like the book of revelations is called that because it's revealing something where the apocalypse is pull back the curtain on reality and they show it's what's really been going on underneath what we thought was our reality. Um, and this is one of those times. There's no way there's not, this is from something everyone acknowledges. So I say this because I think for students, um, who are grad? So I started college um, three weeks before 9/11. I graduated four years later in 
in, and got a job in the financial services industry. And two years after that, the recession started because of the housing crisis. So I've been through this myself. Um, and I think that something that's important to remember is moments of apocalypse are moments of clarification. Um, sometimes they're like places where we can stop and say, hang on, is the trajectory I'm on actually what I think is going is where I'm supposed to be like is the thing I've been driving at the place I actually want to be driving at um, is the the point that I've been uh, seeing as my future flourishing actually where flourishing is going to be and that's sometimes the answer is yes and that's good and then you're frustrated because you feel called to something that um, doesn't really exist so like I work in media I have no idea what the future of media is it's always scary it's especially scary right now um, but moments of apocalypse are a really good time to sit down and take stock of what you think is real and make sure that it actually is real. Like, what is it? Is it that you want to be a journalist or is it that you want to communicate with people or you want to tell truth or what are those different things that um, that are actually driving what you've been driving yourself at? And then also to remember that um, this is going to be hard and difficult and it's it's not going to probably look anything like you thought it would have two months ago but that doesn't mean it's the end of the story like you're not doomed to some kind of I don't know whatever it is that is coming up in your nightmares right now um like this isn't a surprise um certainly to God um but also people have been figuring out how to live through crisis for all of human history and we are, it does feel like, certainly for millennials, like we've been through this before pretty recently and we're gonna probably go through it again, but it is a way to think about, okay, what, what actually are my priorities here? What do I actually think is important? What is real reality? And for people who are really thinking about creativity, justice, all those things, this is a real moment of clarification about places that our culture has been deficient in mm. creativity, um, in solving problems, been deficient in justice for people who need it. So how can you be part of the solution is a really big question, I think. And maybe that's what you're going to do for a while, and then you're going to go on and do something else. But this is a real moment of I don't want to say opportunity because that sounds like finding silver linings, but it certainly is a moment where creativity um, is vital. We need creative ways to solve these problems, not the old ways. They're not working. And we know that now. So helpful. And I'm just going to put a pin in the, the, the comment about injustices and things that are getting revealed because I, I want to make sure we come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't we go to Lecrae? What, what advice would you give to a student who kind of like I described and, you know, launching out in the world wants to make, uh, be a culture maker and in this context, what, what, what advice would you give? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, I would say, um, you know, if you are indeed a student, um, the best way to become an authority on anything is to submit to authorities. Um, and so submitting to some authoritative views um, on what has happened historically in, in this circumstance that we're in, uh, reading about the Great Depression, reading about plagues of old, and how people navigated, uh, what were the, the, the principles that you can extract from that in order to move forward um, and, and help in this particular season, in this time that we're in. Um, I found it interesting to look at people who uh, survived, you know, uh, world wars when the world was turned upside down and um, talking to my friends in the Middle East where, uh, you know, uh, refugees whole entire lives have been disrupted and they're having to reprocess and rethink everything about what they're doing. And I've found um, that there are just some incredible principles that can be extracted from, from uh, these scenarios that we can apply here and now. Um, obviously, um, as, as Alyssa said, the, these are not uh, instances where God is caught off guard. As a matter of fact, uh, throughout a, a biblical narrative, you see tons of uh, plagues and famines and wars and captivities and people being stripped from their land mm -hmm. and having to figure out what to do. And, you know, and I, and I think of, uh, you know, Israel being in captivity and, and being told you're going to be here for 70 years. What I need you to do now is, 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 you know, raise families and, and plant gardens and, 
and build homes and cities. And so there's a, there's a sense, a call for us to uh, engage and get our hands wrapped up in this new normal, in this new reality. Um, and obviously there's gotta be a moment of grief. We, we've got to acknowledge what, where we are. I think um, what I, what I, I, I kind of like give a, a snapshot answer for people to think through. I, I tell people to digest uh, digest the reality of where we are right now um, because it's going to take you time to just understand what in the world is going on. Uh, then, then assess, assess, um, you know, where needs need to be met and where things need to be reshaped and, and regrouped and where uh, you can do, do away with some things that were excess. And after assess, invest, find ways to invest in, uh, society yourself your community your your you know your your relationships i've had an incredible time in, um, investing in my relationship with my family uh being here in isolation and there's been some incredible moments that have have just sprung up um where where we there are going to be things that after this quarantine is lifted that i'm going to miss as grievous as this is uh, there'll be moments that i'm going to miss because i was quarantined in and, and having to do it. But that's what I would say to a student is, you know, digest the reality of, of what's happening, assess uh, where needs can be met and how you can help shape the culture um, and invest into, into, it, into the culture. And that's done through uh, becoming an authority on, on where we are and what we're uh, sitting in right now. Marco, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, I know that's, that's really, well said, Jeremiah twenty nine is you know what Lucre is talking about, and and it, it, you know um, uh, prophet prophet Jer Jeremiah in exile uh, in Babylon, and God tells Jeremiah to settle down and and plant trees and get married and um, all all the activities that we're we're supposed to be doing. Um, will continue in exile, and this line of seek, seek the peace and prosperity of the city uh, to which I have called you. Um, and right now, the city is 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 shut down, um, but the command still stands. Um, so, what does that mean to seek the peace and prosperity? Uh, of this land, uh, regardless of whether we have jobs or uh, not. Now, obviously, economy is important, and you know we don't want to neglect the necessary work to rejuvenate uh, that uh, into the world. But as like Ray said, I don't want to go back to the world in which uh, before this crisis, um, because just by doing the same thing. Um, we're going to be exiled once again <laughs> from um, what really the rehumanized capitals that we found during this time. And I talk about this in my culture care book, but you know, let's say there's three, uh, let's say there's a triangle of capitals. The, at the bottom base is the financial material capital that you know we, we often think about when we talk about capital. But the, uh, the other two uh, sides, uh, one is social capital and the other is creative capital. And I always tell artists that the only thing that's limited in the triangle is the material capital. Because the social capital and creative capital, they're infinite. And so while you need a little bit of material capital to pay rent and so forth, um, what you really need is to cultivate the creative and the social capitals, <laughs> because those, those are the ones that can amplify the very little that you have into something more substantial. And, and um, we can uh, um, begin to um, understand our lives as, as limited as they may be right now. What if we invested in social capital, you know, by calling up your grandmother? Um, what if we uh, invested in your creative capital by writing that song that we've been meaning to write? Um, that is going to do more 
uh, with the limited capital, even if that base narrows down, uh, hopefully not to zero, but just enough so, so we can keep going. Uh, the time that you invested in these two infinite capitals are going to be multiplied in the days to come. So, so to me, um, you know, this time of recalibration is, is almost like a, a necessary one for me because, you know, I have been running around doing this and doing that. And I, I pull back and think at this, this, you know, these two weeks, uh, what am I really about? And what am I really investing? Am I seeking the peace and prosperity of, of the city? that I am called to, that I'm exiled to. And, it, you know, and, and this, this is a moment when all of us can do that together. Um, and and this, is, this is a time where we re recalibrate all of us. Now, I remember when I graduated way back in 1983, um, the, the employment uh, rate, rate was, uh, very low and you know unemployment was very high and and um, and people were asking like I don't have a job you know I don't have um, and and yet um, you know I just uh, found a part time job teaching at a special ed school and I spent the afternoon painting um, morning and afternoon I I learned a lot right and and we just had a lot of tuna cans you know to eat um but but that was that was okay you know i look back in that time and the time invested in my art i intentionally decided that this is my life you know i i i have freedom to do this right now uh, even though we may you know be low on our bank account um i'm going to invest in my art and um i wouldn't be who i am without that so we're going to move uh, now just completely to student questions. We've worked in a number of them already, but we'll go kind of full in that direction. A couple notes just as we do that. Um, one, just a reminder of how the Q&A works. So again, put your questions in the Q&A window, upvoting brings them up to the top. Um, so we can kind of curate among the, the more popular ones. Um, and the other just thing to note is, I mean, a huge part of our value here at Veritas is interac interaction questions, kind of, you know, that, that engagement and, and dialogue that we stand for. Um, and one of the things we've been doing throughout the week to kind of cultivate these sort of questions and this seeking together has been uh, Instagram profiles of search is what we call them. And so we've been profiling students throughout the week. And, uh, you know, as, as you all uh, navigate these transitions and what kind of fundamental questions this is raising about direction, purpose, identity, what kind of a reset we could be imagining for parts of our society. And so, I uh, would encourage you to, to tune in to that too. It's, it's really fun to follow. Um, but why don't we go kind of completely into student questions. Um, and I'm getting one here. We've got a couple coming in that are sort of around this theme. Maka, you were talking about kind of a, a reset or a moment to kind of take stock. Alyssa, you said sort of the same thing. Um, this one's a little more for Lecrae um, and sort of with the context, Lecrae, of, of you know, you've in, in your music and you've spoken about themes of justice um, and inequality and sort of how to be thinking about and engaging that. Um, what, so the question is, um, what sort of injustices or things that just are broken in our society would you be hoping uh, we could take kind of stock of again as a part of this kind of collective moment of uh, unveiling, I think Alyssa said. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, um, <clears throat> You know, to um, obviously there's various philosophical perspectives on um, societies and how societies are best run. Um, I, I do think that um, ultimately uh, there is no perfect system, um, you know, that has sprung from the mind of humanity in terms of how to run a society. Um, we, we function as best as we possibly can, but uh, we see through a dim lens. We don't see as clearly as we should. And, and so um, I think what is being revealed um, are, what I would like to see revealed uh, are 
how there was so much vanity um, that we were consumed with so much vanity that we overlooked uh, the most vulnerable. We overlooked uh, the most uh, uh, susceptible to, uh, you know, disease and death and opportunity. And um, in, in a time like this, I, I remember when I, when, when I first began to take, um, you know, this pandemic seriously, um, I, I thought about myself naturally, you know, the human condition. I thought about me and how this affects my life and my circumstances and my surroundings. And, and then I, I, I realized, or I had the thought that, oh my goodness, I have the ability to process this. I have the ability to think through these things and the ability to self-isolate and to run to the grocery store to buy the things that I need. And I thought about all of the people who don't have that luxury, that ability to, to merely survive uh, what, is what is needed to survive and, um, and how many vanities that we, we take part in. So I guess all that to say, um, I would hope that this is revealed to us how, how we have left a vast majority of society vulnerable and, um, and how uh, as, a, as a, a society, as a, as a world, um, these gaping holes that we were blind to because of our own vanity and our own self-pursuit uh, come to fruition or, or, or help us to realize we didn't need so many of these things that we thought we needed. And there are people who need the simplest things uh, that, that, you know, we are, um, we take for granted every day. And so um, uh, an organization that I've gotten to partner with is an organization uh, based in Atlanta called Love Beyond Walls. And, um, and I called my friend Terrence who runs that organization. And I said, you know, they, they specifically uh, uh, help people who are experiencing homelessness. And I said, what are people doing? And he said, they're just scared. They have no outlets, no opportunities. And, um, and he said, I just want to simply provide them the option to clean their hands. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so something as simple as that resonated with me deeply. And I, and I said, and how can I partner with you um, on that? But, but that's what opened up my eyes to there are some, so many simple things that we take for granted that, um, that are now the, the difference between life and death. <laughs> Yeah, one one of the things that I I, I just want to flag what Alyssa said and and uh, and and the Gray's comment uh, reminded me that um, one of, one of the invisible capitals that we have to work on is is the uh, mercy capital. Uh, mercy and beauty are two elements of the new creation that the old cannot account for. Uh, it, it it is not a Darwinian um, uh, you know advantage to be merciful to the poor, to, uh, to uh, love your enemies, to, uh, and, and also to create beauty. But, but at the same time, we, we need to rec recognize those two elements usher in the new in, in a way that Jesus accentuated that, you know, blessed are the poor. And it, it, it's, it's somehow the calculation of the kingdom is, is upside down. From the reality of you know our um, how how we view a success model, and and so this is a uh, talk about recalibration. We we can really think about how we would invest our lives into creating beauty or uh, providing mercy. That's great, Alyssa. Would you have anything to add to that? I think, I mean, I think that says a lot of it. I think. Um, I also have been thinking about how assumptions we've made about the way the world should work, like who's on what team or um, where the borders between people are, um, are challenged by this. I mean, one thing I keep thinking about so much is how viruses and the way they spread prove that borders and uh, between states and countries and groups of people are completely fictitious. <laughs> They're just yes. invented by people in order to keep some people in and some people out. And um, viruses don't, they don't bend to like our big bravado or our rhetoric or any of those things. It's, it's, that's, and so I don't think it's 
like I'm, I'm, I'm sad and horrified that this is having that effect, but I think it also has a way of putting us in our place and reminding us that like, we're all humans. We're all affected by the same thing. It's not really anyone's fault that the virus exists, right? That we have to together find solutions to this. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot and that the lines we draw between us and them, whatever that us and them is, are just, they're just inventions, right? They're not real. Um, and they don't have to always be drawn the way they are, that they can change. Um, and this is something that that's reminded me of. Okay, uh, awesome. We're, so we're actually starting to come up on time. Um, would love to ask maybe just one more question here. And, and one of them that's uh, come up a lot is this question of how do we create art that really serves others? Um, and especially in the, one of the questions provides this context that says, you know, in an age of sort of hyper aware identity appropriation, where everyone's speaking from a, you know, whether it's a gender or, you know, racial identity, or, you know, you can imagine the, you know, age or uh, uh, socioeconomic status. Um, what does it look like to actually create art that serves sort of more than just that identity appropriation uh, that really like serves more broadly and could actually potentially bring us together? Um, uh, one one I thing would, I would want to say just right off the bat is that the answer isn't to try to make universal art. The answer is to try and make very specific art because as a critic, one thing I notice is that whenever people try to speak universally, what they often wind up doing is watering down who they are and what is unique about them and their position and who they are and what their circumstances and what their cultural background is, what their race is, what their gender is, all those things. But when you can really speak authentically out of your place, that's something that people seem to be able to connect with. And um, so just from a critical perspective, this is something I think about all the time. And the art that I really respect is the stuff that's speaking with an authentic voice from the person who made it. Um, that's, yeah. That would be my yeah, answer. And, and that authentic voice um, often will not be anything that is serviceable. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, it, it, it doesn't uh, frame itself, at least in the beginning when it's made, because it's so authentic. Um, and, and it's not just self-expression. People mistake that. You know, part of the identity politics is that, oh, this is my self-expression. But art is not about self-expression. Uh, it, can, it can be part of that. Oh, obviously, um, you know, we, we find that whatever our pinhole is and we express that. But when you really delve down, when you have the discipline to push into it, uh, you find yourself losing yourself at the end. It, it becomes a kind of a um, weird paradox. The more you understand w how unique you are, the more universal it becomes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you have to lose yourself. And, and, and to find you, find you yourself. Uh, but but that's at the same time, you know, a, a lot of the language of what I call utilitarian pragmatism that is pervasive in the church is not helpful for artists. It, it's actually detrimental to their growth. Um, they, you know, for, for instance, oh, it's, uh, people say, well, uh, it's wonderful that you're a Christian artist. And I say, well, I'm not a Christian artist. And they say, what? You know, you, you're an elder, you, you do all these things. And I say, I am a photo of Christ. And I don't use the term Christian as an adjective. <laughs> I, to me, uh, Christ is, is at the center of my heart. And he, he is a noun. You know, he, he's a person. Um, I, I don't dare, you know, push him aside uh, to put art at the center. So, so. Many times, unwittingly, the church will will force an artist to be an adjective existence, you know, Christian worship leader, Christian whatever plumber, um, and and that that doesn't help the practice. Uh, it doesn't help the authenticity, finding that voice. And I I want you know to to be just as authentic myself. Um, you know, so, so therefore, it may not look like it. If you're really authentic, you may not serve anybody. You know, Emily Dickinson writing at 3 a.m. in her little Cherrywood desk in Amherst, she, didn't, she wasn't thinking about, 
uh, is this useful? She was thinking about, is this needed for me at this moment and for the world that she ambitiously thought will some, someday read her poems? Um, you know, it's amazing that we look at her work of Vincent van Gogh's work that nobody cared about. It wasn't serviceable at all to society. And they have become the essence, the essential, the most essential part of, of our culture. So, so the, these are some of the things we have to navigate through to, to address that question. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, I, I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> almost to the T. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would have to totally agree. Um, uh, again, I think that, um, I, I mean, to reiterate what, what, what Michael, M Michael said, uh, the, the, the pragmatism um, that oftentimes is forced upon us, um, even societal pragmatism, where you're constantly battling art versus commerce, art versus commerce, art versus mm -hmm. commerce, instead of um, focusing on creating authentic art um, and, and, and authentic expression, um, I think the pragmatism of it, it's not good if it's not uh, sold to the highest bidder. It's not good if it's not yeah. a blockbuster hit um, creeps into uh, our creative process and we begin to sell ourselves short as artists and as creatives in terms of, of how to make something that is truly um, uh, needed and, and truly a, a reflection of the created, the creativity, the, the creator uh, that has put this creativity within us. Um, I think we sell ourselves short when we allow the, that to be um, in conflict. And so, um, yeah, I, Michael said it all. I mean, that was excellent. I love your stuff. You always get me in trouble when I say that type of stuff, though. I just want you to know that whenever I say I'm not a Christian artist, I get in trouble for it. But I appreciate it. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> oh, this is, well, this has been fantastic. Uh, truly, truly fantastic. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we hope, you know, for everybody tuning in, like this, this is just the beginning of a conversation. We're going to be talking about this for a very very long time and look forward to profiting from Mako, Alyssa, and Lecrae, not only your wisdom, but what you, what you produce, what you go and, and create and uh, just looking forward to thankful for you um, mm -hmm. and your voice in this time. So I just want to thank you all uh, for mm -hmm. joining us. Please uh, just join me in, in thanking Mako and Alyssa and Lecrae. Thank so you. thank you guys. Mm -hmm.